And I'd like to thank the organizers, uh, Judith and Jack and James for organizing what's been a really great conference. And I'm uh, really delighted to be here. I really enjoyed the week. And I'd like to thank ICMS for um, also helping to facilitate this. It's my second conference here in three weeks. So I feel <laughs> extra gratitude toward them. So um, today I want to uh, give it a, just this is the goal for the talk. I just want to present an approach to um, proving, well, I'll get to this in a moment, algebraicity and piadic interpolation of, well, in this case, uh, critical values of all functions and apply this uh, in the context of spin all functions for GSP6. And this application here This is joint with Giovanni Rosso and Shrenik Shah. And I should, the, the parenthetical piece was actually our original goal for these L functions. And it's something we're um, still doing. I'll say more about that in the talk. But uh, we first started working on this project in. Um, a special semester, at, or some of you were at EPFL uh, years ago, and uh, we're like, okay, we're going to start to construct these piadic L functions. But we committed a bit of a faux pas, which was that uh, no one had proved algebraicity of the values you wanted to interpolate. And I know this is a conference on piadic modular forms, so we can't talk about piad. Like, there's no Sayre's theory or Katz's theory or Hida or anyone passed there without all older results about algebraicity. So we had to prove this first. This paper is uh, essentially um, essentially done. We're fixing some stuff in the introduction. And then um, namely that our intro says we do this full thing. Uh, and then we, we as I'll talk about uh, at the, toward the end of the talk, I'll also talk about uh, this piece. Originally, we're like, oh, this is going to be one giant paper. Then I guess we'll have to do algebraicity before piadic interpolation. That's like never how it, uh, never how it goes. There's always like a, an algebraicity result, and much later, <laughs> piadic uh, a, a piadic result. So, um, I want to just start with two um, motivating examples. So, And I'll run through these relatively quickly so that we can um, focus more on the, the application in the in the second half of the talk. So the first uh, example is just to put in quotes and then I'll give one precise example is um, use, um, I'll just say, um, Using Fourier coefficients of Eisenstein series to establish properties uh, either algebraicity, rationality, uh, piadic of all functions by realizing an L function in the constant term of your Eisenstein series. This is not always a, a practical approach, but it's probably the most a familiar one if you don't if you don't work, if you're someone who's here who works with piadic modular forms that doesn't work with L functions. So um, just sub example of this broad example, if you look at um, the just the weight 2k level one Eisenstein series and greater than or equal to one, and then you piece stabilize it as we've had to do many times this week. Um, so here, this is just a modification of the Riemann zeta function at P 
and these are just modified divisor functions. Um, Sayre's idea, which was really building an earlier work for rationality of uh, Hecke and later Klingen and Siegel, um, Sayre's idea was to give a new proof of uh, congr Kummer's congruences and, uh, and Kubota and Leopold's piadic zeta function by using congruences between higher order terms to study the um, lower order terms. So can you guys see if it right here or should I go to the next? Speak up if you don't want it here. Okay, I see thumbs up, so even better. Okay, um, so uh, Sarah used congruences behind, between and piadic interpolation between these higher order coefficients. So, um, two k prime minus one of n mod powers of d to prove uh, the Kummer congruences, namely. for um, appropriate conditions on k and k prime. So if these are congruent mod Euler phi function of p to the d and satisfy an additional uh, divisibility condition, then in fact, the output is also congruent. But the, over, the overarching idea is we have something we want to study, an L function, in this case, the Riemann zeta function, uh, hard to study potentially. Uh, but instead, um, we use a structured space of modular forms and we've got it, uh, and we can use properties of the higher order coefficients to prove something about the constant term. These guys are easy to study, easy to understand, easy to prove congruence for, easy to interpolate, and we get then um, analogous properties for this guy. And then that was extended. Uh, so similar approach is carried out in um, so um, well and. Uh, inspired the work of Deline and Rivet and earlier Coates and Sinnott um, uh, using um, in the space of Hilbert modular forms, uh, Eisenstein series there, which have some um, uh, have the character of a totally real field as the constant term uh, plus so we've got higher order terms here. So these are the these are the Eisenstein series that, as I understand it, uh, Havard yesterday meant uh, what he referred to as the usual Eisenstein series. So uh, those are. Okay, so those are to me the usual ones anyway. So um, that that spoke to me. Um, of course, before Sarah could do any of this, so um, uh, really before before Sarah's work, the rationality results for these L values uh, by um, Klingen and Siegel get often. Uh, credited for this, but before that, also uh, Hecke has established a lot of this. And uh, going back to a few days ago in Xenia's talk, I think uh, Marco asked, like, what, what about algebraicity? And she's that was established by uh, someone else. So this is the someone else before, I guess, if Sarah had been asked, what about algebraicity? Those are the, those are the someone else's. Um, Okay, that's great. Often, though, uh, this is not actually like this is this is useful in the sense that it says, "Oh, okay, there's, we're going to use something about coefficients of Eisenstein series, this be something about L functions." That's something in our case being algebraicity or piadic properties. Um, but in practice, uh, a lot of the time, if we even well, if 
we can even make any uh, progress at all, we need something slightly more involved, which is some kind of rankin selberg style uh, pairing. So if we take, um, so one was using, that was our first approach, uh, say using some pairing of Eisenstein series against cusp form, or which for us it'll be one cusp form uh, in an application, but in the example I'm going to give you, it's a pair of cusp forms. And so just for a precise sub example of this example here, um, you could look at, say, um, take two modular forms. Say the first one is a cusp form. Say K, this one will be L. Um, then we can look at the um, rankin selberg convolution of these guys, which at least for sufficiently large S, looks like the Dirichlet series A N B N over N to the S, and greater than or equal to one here. And uh, this guy here is uh, proved by Shimura in, for, for appropriate values of S. Um, to uh, lie inside of um, the field generated by the, this, this is the field generated by the Fourier coefficients of F and G um, times the power of pi dependent on the weight here times this Peterson pairing. Uh, this is a Peterson pairing of F against itself. Um, this was proved for, I need to add some condition. You can't just plug in whatever old S you want, like pi plus I and uh, hope for something nice, or you can hope, but uh, kind of misplaced. So this was proved by um, Shimura, this algebraicity result was, oh, and I need k bigger than l here. So, um, like in, there's some condition here, like in results we saw earlier in the week. Uh, this was proved by um, Shimura in the 70s for s, um, an integer with a uh, A plus L minus two over two plus an S plus an K. And the key, the key observation here that allowed Shimura to do this was that he, um, and actually he was building on earlier work of Rankin, but this is usually attributed to Shimura. Um, this is some rational number here uh, times pi to the k, um, some slight, slight tweak of uh, f. Um, I'll explain these symbols in just a second. So we've got some, he wrote uh, this guy as a Peterson pairing of a slight tweak of our form f times this guy is a, um, a differential operator here, a Mas Shimura operator. Um, this is an Eisenstein series of weight lambda equals k minus l plus um, two r here. This guy raises the weight of the of this. Eisenstein series by 2r every time you, um, oh, whoops, I want to add 2r and this is how you start. It raises the weight by 2r every time you apply it. So um, once you've applied this guy to here, you've got something of weight uh, k minus l, and then you've multiplied it by the weight l form. So you're taking a Peterson pairing of two weight k forms. Um, this guy, this guy right here, the way I've written is holomorphic, but once you apply the differential operator, it's no longer um, holomorphic, but it's nearly holomorphic, which is enough to retain certain algebraicity uh, properties. 
And um, this, uh, this approach here ended up uh, being useful for uh, um, proving lots more algebraicity, but also it's going to be the one we'll use later in the talk. It's also uh, inspired then um, PETA in the uh, 80s uh, periodically interpolated these guys, so it constructed periodic um, rankin selberg L functions, uh, sometimes twisted by a character, then varying forms in PETA families later in the early 2000s that was extended by uh, Panchishkin. Um, and uh, it, at least in certain favorable cases, we do have uh, analogs of the rankin uh, selberg method that allow us to construct certain automorphic L functions um, and let us express the values of certain Peterson pairings. The reason that like I said this is a key observation, if you work with this sort of thing, you're like, oh, probably like, oh yeah, yeah, I know how this goes. And if you don't work with it, you're probably like, why is this like any better? I now have a different integral, like some analytic thing, some integral. So the point is in the space of modular forms that um, you uh, decompose this uh, this form here. You just decompose your cuspidal space into a basis that's orthogonal with respect to this pairing, uh, and that decomposition is um, algebraic. And uh, and oh, and you need. I didn't say this was an eigenform. I should have. Should be an eigenform. Uh, so you can extend that eigenform to a basis and uh, an orthogonal basis. And so what you end up with at the end is a pair pairing basically of F against its um, against itself times some algebraic uh, algebraic thing. And so this is there, this is like a very nice approach as long as um it's a nice approach as long as you can express the uh, values of the L function that you want in this form in the first place. And in uh this kind of the state of the art currently is a bit ad hoc there. So we have different things called integral representations, which are um, analogs of the rankin selberg integral. Um, and sometimes they're sufficient. I mean, sometimes we don't have them at all, but it's active industry. If we do have them, sometimes they're suitable for proving algebraicity. Sometimes that can be adapted to periodic approaches. Sometimes it can't. Because the other thing that one gets out of these uh, pairings here is just proving things that you expect for an L function, like a functional equation, analytic continuation, basic properties that like are not the focus of this workshop, but that's often like the people who are creating these um, pairings that lead you to have this kind of statement are often motivated by very different things from uh, people who are, in, or at least different, depending on, I won't, it's very judgment, but uh, different, different things, analytic um, aspects from uh, many people in this room. And um, so it's even if you like, even if you've got some integral expressing your L function, it's not a given that you can get this, but uh, we will be in a, a favorable situation in the cases I'm going to talk about um, today. So uh, I want to tell you just about a few others where um, this is uh, carried out. So just what's going on here. So idea. Right, the first thing here is we want to find um, uh, integral representation, meaning not integral in the sense of the ring of integers, but an actual integral uh, representation expressing our L function as something like um, some Eisenstein series times test form, or in this case, it ends up being over some appropriate space. Uh, and then uh, express um, it's a Peterson pairing. Um, and then when I use algebraicity properties of M modular forms or automorphic forms, Uh, 
but especially um, Eisenstein series uh, to uh, conclude altericity properties. And analogously, uh, supposing that unlike my collaborators and me, uh, you uh, are correct in assuming somebody has already approved the algebraicity. If you wanted to do piadic things, um, the like if you look at Vita's paper here, for instance, which is the first model of this being carried out in piadic situation, uh, you would again be starting from a similar point, um, but instead of say proving algebraicity of the Eisenstein series, you need to see that the coefficients piadically interpolate so that you're back in the land where Sarah was. And in general, this requires a um, a lot of work. It doesn't look like, like, um, I like giving this example in talks because everyone has seen this. This Eisenstein series is concrete. You can grasp it. You don't, I don't have to be like, take my word for it. The coefficients are nice and interpolate. You can just see it. Um, but in reality, in most of the uh, higher rank cases, it's a little bit, a lot of work that goes into, you have to construct this guy, show it, you make nice choices, show that the coefficients actually um, have a nice form and that they periodically interpolate and so on. So uh, where has this been uh, carried out? Um, And I should note, in case this wasn't clear from what I've said already, even though my collaborators and I had to start by proving an algebraicity result, um, in like all the examples I know of, the piadic result is building, like the approach to the piadic side is building on the setup from the algebraic side. So it's like a natural thing we would have to understand either way, regardless of whether someone else had done it first or, or we uh, had to do it ourselves. So uh, this, this kind of approach has been carried out in, um, in uh, various other uh, settings. So like, uh, where else does this uh, work? So we've got an uh, L function of a Hecke character up here. We've got an L function attached to some modular forms. So another natural thing to do. So that's kind of like going from GL1 to GL2. Um, the I should note there are also other uh, algebra. Um, there are other approaches to algebraicity, uh, but I'm focusing on one fruitful approach. So I don't see Laden here, but oh, there you're right there. Yeah. So uh, he and his collaborators use a a different um, a different. Uh, approach that also uh, so you would probably have a different a different list here um of what inspired uh, his approach so um where else does uh, does this approach work uh so natural thing we had to gl1 we had gl2 so let's move to um like uh some higher rank group so um uh so one place uh, this has been carried out uh, in my own work in particular is uh, working with a, a cuspidal automorphic representation twisted by a hacky character. I'll tell you uh, what, let me explain this notation. So with um, pi here is a cuspidal automorphic representation, pi is a Hecke character. Um, this is either a, a supleptic group or of a unitary group. You can take any rank you want here, any signature you want here. Uh, this was done in, well, uh, piadic, algebraic, and then uh, piadic interpolation was done pretty recently. This was Zhang Liu, there's a lot of 
maybe it's actually been mentioned here. So I think this is one who's not been mentioned in the workshop. So uh, Zhang uh, Liu in uh, 2020 in a paper in Jisu and uh, by myself and Michael Harris and Jen Xu Li and Chris Skinner also in a paper published in 2020 in um, Forum of Math High. And uh, it built on earlier algebraicity results for both of these due to um, Shimura, Harris, and um, to some extent, Garrett. There's also a variety of others who filled in some of the various cases, but the overarching uh, strategy for algebraicity, from, um, uh, primarily from these, especially from these people. And um, the, the, the key ingredient here that takes the place of this Rankin-Selberg approach from over here, so this integral is something called the doubling method that was discovered in the 80s by Piotrowski, Shapiro, uh, uh, Piotrowski, Shapiro, and um, Rallis. And um, one reason we're working with symplectic or unitary groups here instead of like bumping up to say, I don't know, GL3 or something, since we had GL1, GL2, and so on, is probably the reason that many people here probably uh, would guess, which is that we have Shimura varieties attached to these guys and nice ge geometric properties. And so um, I guess from the point of view of applications, it's good to have geometry there, but also just from the point of view of our construction and getting um, nice piatic properties, we need some some space of appropriate structure to work with and these piatic modular forms lay over the ordinary locus of a, uh, for, at least in my paper, for uh, a unitary Shimura variety. Um, the, the Eisenstein series that goes into here is in my earlier work in um, two split between two papers, Krella and Algebra and Number Theory, even so this paper is 160 pages even though it's building on the other stuff. So like a lot, a lot goes into here, but it follows this general um, uh, general idea. So another another thing you might ask if you're trying to see like how far can you um, how far can you push this method is um, like uh, what about um, so these are standard L functions. Usually, if you if you saw me give a talk on this after this work was done several years ago, I wouldn't have bothered saying standard, but that's supposed to clue you into what you're supposed to wonder next is instead of changing the group, what about changing um, a representation here? So if you're in specifically in the symplectic case, your Langland's dual group is a spin group. So you could ask about um, What about this case? The doubling method, the kind of uh, what takes, what uh, satisfies step one here, that's that's for standard L functions. So we can't uh, work with that. We have to have some starting place to begin with that says, hey, these L values are uh, obtained from Eisenstein series in cusp forms, or we're not, or we're not in business. Um, and so for here, just to be clear, this is a cuspital automorphic representation of um, GSP, let's say, uh, 2G. One of these cases is very uh, familiar to you, whether you or should be familiar to you, whether you realize it or not, which is just the G equals one case, because then all you're talking about is um, the L function of a modular form. So uh, that hasn't taken us, that's, that's not gone very far from somehow where we, Started. And when I'm asking, like, what about this guy? Um, what about it, I mean, is what can we say about algebraicity? What can we say about piatic interpolation? I, I guess there are a lot of things you could ask what about, but in the context of this talk and this conference, those are the things I'm assuming 
uh, if you care about anything all about that, I'm assuming those are your top priorities to learn. So uh, we could look at G equals one. This is the one I was saying is just modular form. So this is just your familiar L of um, SF, possibly twisted by a um, heck of character. I'm gonna just, I might not always twist by the heck of character. That's not the like, the hard part here. Um, so I might leave that, drop that just for ease of notation. So we can ask about this guy. Uh, we can similarly ask about proof of algebraicity and about uh, piatic interpolation, what's been done for that. So this was already done by uh, Shimura in the 70s. And um, and then this has been studied by, by many people, but early work was Mazur. Title bomb just to list an initial one, but this is a heavily a studied uh, setting. Then you can go to G equals two. Uh, now, in this case, we've got uh, for algebraicity, this was done by Michael Harris in um, 2004 in this paper that has occult in the title. I never remember the rest of the title, but occult, like uniquely, I you know, probably none of us have written or considered writing a paper with occult in the title. So um, so he proved algebraicity. Again, he needs he needs some, imp, uh, so he needs to have this piece here. And there's an integral of Novogorsky, which is kind of Reagan Selberg style uh, integral. And then um, much more recently, uh, David Leffler and uh, Vincent Peony and Chris Skinner and Sarah Zerbes. Um constructed this is in 2021 in a paper in Duke, uh, construct piatic L functions and inter interpolating these uh, these values here. I should note that the work of um as they also note in there for the end of their introduction. Um, some of it uh, can be seen as a different approach to obtaining particular results of a special case of results of um, Mladen and uh, the collaborators I was mentioning for and his collaborators for Janusz Hesky and what? Uh, and Ragaram, what? There are also some students who are collaborators who are in the room like- Who should I be noted for my- like Williams Pereira. Ah, okay, yes, yes. And so we've got, yeah, uh, David, which is some, okay. And well, and Chris Williams has worked with this. And so a variety of people have worked with this, uh, uh, work with a different approach that gets some of this. Uh, one of the, re the reason I put this specific thing here down is that it's, it's following this approach. And um, I mentioned that for applications, uh, geometry can be, uh, convenient. So even though it looks like maybe you're covering a special case of that as far as a particular application that uh, Sarah and David and their other collaborators who are not here are approaching this, this is this is advantageous for what the uh, what their goals are. Uh, is that a fair assessment since <laughs> okay <laughs> comparing people's work in front of them? What? My side. <laughs> is that a fair assessment? <laughs> <laughs> no? okay. It's more than like okay. more than fair. Okay, okay, great. More than fair. Okay. Great. Okay. Okay, great. So uh then uh the next thing I promise the talk will not continue just being a rest of like a enumerating slowly one, two, three. Um so uh this this is the top topic for the rest of the talk. So this is um uh, my work with uh um Giovanni and Shrenak. So that's what we're about to talk about. Uh, this is this is a theorem. It's basically the paper is basically done. We're fixing some things in the intro to account for the fact that we don't do everything we originally claimed for this setting, but we can periodically interpolate. The one thing we cannot do is uh, we have this modified Euler factor at p, which we saw explicitly in that example here, and our we know what the Euler factor at p should be. And we we have I think I know I mean I into a strategy or two strategies for showing that um, what the modification in our case is gives that but I mean it's it's quite involved we have not carried carried that out so um, I should just say this is uh, we can periodically interpolate 
uh, which depending on your <laughs> your viewpoint from here, maybe that's enough for you in a piatic module. We can pia we get a piatic family of Eisenstein series, so uh, we uh, have piatic modular forms, but I uh, we don't have the state of the re result that we would uh, from the point of view of U.S. Summer theory uh, like. Um, uh, the but I'm optimistic with more work. One could get that, uh, but we've been publishing this paper. And you might have seen me speak about this before and maybe emphasize this side, but actually uh, the result here that we have here is much nicer than it looked like a month ago for a crazy reason, which is that apparently I transposed like two things and then propagated this typo. And I was like, oh no, when editing, like there's a typo and it's been like going through, but it turned out that typo made the result worse. And now that it's uh, fixed, we have a, a nicer, so the theorem I'll state for this guy is gonna look better than whatever you, um, uh, if you've seen me speak about this at all before, what you saw before. So, um, okay, and what about the, I, I promise we wouldn't keep enumerating, that's because, uh, well, I mean, conjecturally, due to Deleen, there should be algebraic values, and due to Greenberg and Iwasawa, we should have piatic L functions, but uh, uh, it's just a big uh, set of question marks right now. Um, I think there probably is no one in this audience who's about to, is anyone about to object to this? Probably no in this audience, but I will just tell you, I. Uh, if you're like, wait, I watched this and there's the, I ha there are integral representations for this due to Bump and Ginsburg. You can get up to maybe G equals five or six, but they're not amenable, like at least from what anyone right now at least knows to proving anything about algebraicity or piatic interpolation. So uh, if you just want to uh, do uh, important analytic things, like understand things about functional equations and zeros and poles, that'll, uh, that's great for you, but it doesn't, it uh, like, so you can satisfy that, that step one there, but it doesn't actually, you, you can't push it anywhere useful for algebraic and piatic things. So uh, for the rest of this talk, I'm gonna focus on the G equals three case, that being the new thing and, uh, here and being something that I knew and I know how to do. So um, we're gonna let, and just in the interest of time and notation, I'm gonna leave my, we twist by a Dirichlet character, uh, optionally, I'm gonna leave it out of the rest of the talk just to uh, say, well, I'll make things a little more notationally simple and um, not to write quite as much, but uh, it's in there in the background, so. Like if you want to twist by a Dirichlet character, like I put in parentheses there, that's uh, totally fine. So the hospital automorphic representation associated to a hollow a holomorphic um, um, uh, is equal cuspidal eigenform. for GSP6, that being the only case under consideration right here. Um, I'll call this guy phi of um, scalar even weight to R greater than or equal to 12 and level Gamma yeah, upper zero so this probably looks like the opposite of the congruent subgroup you're possibly used to working with. Um, whoops. And level uh, gamma naught of M. And there's a, a a compatibility condition if you twist by Hacker characters, the compatibility condition between the conductor of M and or the conductor of your Hacker character or your 
your Dursley character, and this guy, M here, then what we get is that um, the values of the L function um, remove, this means remove the Euler factors at M, so analogous to what we had to do. So at finitely many primes, Dividing M. Um, this guy over pi to the 4s plus 6r minus 6. Uh, there's a slight condition here analogous to how Shimura had this twiddle. Uh, this thing, this natural symbol here just means uh, conjugate the Fourier coefficients. Uh, this lies inside of the extension um, generated by the Fourier coefficients of B and the values of our Dirichlet character chi uh, for integers S inside of the range 4 up to um, R minus 2. And actually, furthermore, we also get a, um, uh, maybe I'll just say this <laughs> other part because I'm guessing either you study these and care about or otherwise don't have any reason to appreciate it. So we also have a, uh, a Galois equivariance property, meaning that if you ask, like you apply an element of the Galois group of um, C over Q to this whole thing, and you're like, what is that? That's the same thing as applying that individually to the, pieces in here. And Shimura has analogous uh, results in the paper that had that result relying on the, the key observation at the top here. Um, also, uh, there's some additional uh, specializations. So if you assume that your values of, of the, the, if you assume your Fourier uh, coefficients of this guy are a, if there's a constant, so that the Fourier coefficients of this guy are all I, um, or so that if you have a constant C, so that C, the Fourier coefficients of C phi all lie in a CM field, then in fact you can remove this uh, this natural sign here. This, yeah. Although the chi in the numerator is the Oh, I was just saying I'm gonna leave. If you want, you can oh, because you throw that in. I was just saying I'm. Oh, whoops! You're right. Okay. Um. Fine. Okay. Yeah. I better throw, put it in there. Yes. I just made the like spur of the moment decision to delete it, but then it's like have it to check it's there. Um, okay. I will. I will put. I will put it here actually because um, you do have the chi, don't you? You need some power of the Gauss sum as well. Period for chi twisted by chi is not quite the same period as for chi. Uh, sorry. You're saying in here I should have a Gauss sum? Yeah. You do. Okay. Maybe I'm missing. Maybe I'm missing. So okay. I'll just put a little. See here to, to deal with it. Some explicit constant. Yeah. Um, the uh, MSP. Okay, I'll worry about that after. Um, the what was I going to say? Oh, and we need to assume actually that this guy. Uh, so. Um. To assume. Um. Yeah, a particular uh, non-vanishing uh, condition for one of the Fourier coefficients of the cusp form uh, B. Uh, what what is this? Uh, so uh, the uh, we are, what I'm about to get to in a moment when I summarize for the remainder of the talk, when I summarize the proof, we're going to use a result of Aaron Pollock, and uh, this is required in his approach, and so uh, it's required in ours. I should note that this, if you're working in um, level one, which is a, since we're also, this is an algebraicity result, uh, if you're working in um, level one, which you might do, then uh, this is vacuous because the cusp forms are all zero. There's no non-zero uh, 
there's no non-zero choices for fee in that case. And if you're in level one, this condition also uh, is guaranteed to be met. More generally, um, it uh, conjecturally is, but um, it's you can ask me about you can ask me about the technical condition that goes in uh, later if it's of interest, which is probably to a handful of people here. It's like a force Fourier coefficient for GL2. No, 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 it's not like the force Fourier coefficient. It's when you're looking at the Fourier expansion of a Ziegel modular form on specifically on GSP6, um, there is this correspondence uh, between certain, uh, there's a correspondence between, um, so you're looking at some A sub T, Q to the T between these T's, so these half integral matrix, three by three matrices and um, orders in maximal orders in a quaternion algebra over Q and you need one of the ones in this correspondence to not vanish. So it's just some, like it's uh, it's base gross and uh, Dick Gross and uh, Lucia, Lucianovich uh, a while ago explore this and it turns out to be what are needed. Um, but it's not what you had in mind. That's why I'm telling you this. Okay, so Yeah, if you saw me give a talk about this result when it was in progress, you either saw me say this was like algebraic or that it was in some finite extension of Q or most recently that it was in here, a join a few more things, but we've gradually gotten it down. You're not gonna get smaller like this. You're not gonna get smaller than this. So um, it's not gonna improve, which is good since the paper is basically done. So uh, here's our, a summary of our algebraicity proof. Um, and maybe before I get to this, I'll just note we can periodically interpolate these values. Uh, there's going to be some Eisenstein series that come into play analogous to the approach I've been showing so far. We can put those into periodic families. Uh, the one reason I haven't stated the theorem about periodic L functions just has to do with this Euler factor at P, which to be honest, I've known there's a problem with for over a year and have not like and I've been working on uh, working on other like attacking other things like finishing up writing this so that there's some uh public paper so um all right so uh maybe the the first uh thing you need to know is that there's an integral i of the s see let's see uh I'm just gonna avoid some subscripts for, oh yeah, to our, if you're including chi, I guess there's chi here. Um, uh, there's an integral of an Eisenstein series against the cusp form. The Eisenstein series, um, this is say our weight to R guy from the, from the theorem, same guy, uh, we integrate against a Cust, an Eisenstein series of weight 2R, and I guess if you're twisting by chi, there's a chi that this also depends on. Um, this is in, so, Eisenstein series, holomorphic at um, the particular way that this guy is normalized is holomorphic at, um, at S equals R. Um, and, it's looked like a pretty innocuous integral when you maybe first see it, if you don't like, cause I haven't really told you very much about what these things are. I'm like, yeah, there's just some cuts for the eigenform and some Eisenstein series that apparently is reasonably nice since I said we can periodically interpolate it. Um, this Eisenstein series though is restricted from a um, smaller group. So this is a thing that sometimes happens with these integral represent, oh, this is, um, a thing that sometimes happens with these integrals that one looks like that your Eisenstein series starts in some bigger group. Uh, this is defined on a group um, uh, the big group G P 
containing uh, GSP6. And this group, I'm not going to write it down for you, but it preserves a symplectic form and a quartic form that's on a 32-dimensional vector space, which I'm happy to tell you about more later if, if, if you want the details of this, but I'm not going to spend the remaining time in this other talk writing it down. Um, uh, G looks uh, to me like kind of like, or not just to me, it, lo it looks like, it looks like it's not an exceptional group, but it looks a lot like an exceptional group uh, to the extent that actually when we have to study this Eisenstein series here, um, whenever you're trying to study something, right, you try to like reduce to a previously solved problem, you don't just like plug in a brand new group and <laughs> go from scratch. And we build on the work that we're building on where people have computed Fourier coefficients is all for exceptional groups. So it's a very different sort of feel from where I'm uh, used to working. And there's a or now I feel very used to it, but where I was used to working on it when we started this project at um, EPFL. Uh, let me just tell you about this integral, though. I just realized I didn't write down the key thing about it. So I feel like, okay, there's an integral. So what? Um, the, these values of the L function, um, I guess I've now committed to putting chi in, um, uh, are equal to uh, appropriate normalization of S over, this is a, this is a particular Fourier coefficient, the one I was mentioning and answering. Um, Mladen's question, so some particular non-vanishing Fourier coefficient. Um, this is Euler factors away from, or uh, from M. Um, there's some say, defined uh, appropriately times some, um, let's see, times some. Gamma factors, as you might expect, it's pretty uh, typical formulation in this sort of thing, where you're like, oh, I've got some a pairing of an Eisenstein series and some cuts form um, normalized by Euler factors away from uh, my uh, my times m and uh, times some uh, gamma factors. These are these are contributing the power of pi that's showing up um, over here. Um, this result here is due to Aaron Pollock from 2017, which is when we started uh, looking at this. And I was like, oh, this will be so easy because I had like, done this in the doubling method and unitary, or not easy, but straightforward, because I've done this whole recipe before with doubling and unitary groups. And so uh, uh, it turned out like at every stage, like, as often happens for things in math where you think you know the path forward, at like every stage, something ended up being um, harder or different. From um, from before, so uh, we've got this this uh, integral. So what? Somehow we have to get from this to um, we need to get from this to uh, something about algebraicity of L, L values and hopefully something that you can like uh, interpolate. So. Uh, So one observation is that this thing here is just a, this is just a Peterson pairing of our um, Eisenstein series uh, restricted to GSP6 from this bigger group um, G against C, or maybe I need something uh, ending on here. I guess I need a over this speaking. Um, uh, one other thing before I go on, I want to mention about this group uh, G, is it also, um, so it looks pretty different from things that I'd worked with previously, and it doesn't have a known moduli problem. We don't have some known, um, like, analog of, like, unitary Shimura variety where you've got abelian varieties with polarization, endomorphism, and level structure, or uh, moduli space of elliptic curves or something, and so we don't, we don't have a, um, a piatic Q expansion principle, or any theory of piatic modular forms at all, um, uh, which when I realized that was like, I guess, 
I mean, that was relatively early on. I was like, I guess that's the end of um, the, that's the end of the project, I guess. Um, but what we do have, uh, it turns out, so we can compute on G. We can see the the Fourier coefficients of um, our Eisenstein series on G. So. Um, uh, of the Fourier coefficients of the sky um, have a nice form. So like polynomials um, analogous to what you'd expect in other cases, um, nice uh, form um, and lie in Q of chi. Um, they even, they satisfy congruences, but like that's just, uh, there's no, because we don't have a, any, we don't have uh, the kinds of things where you have uh, like a pi to q expansion principle or something. There's no, there's no punchline on G. It's just like, okay, they satisfy congruence. It feels like you should be able to then uh, say something deep or meaningful, but you can't. But what it turns out is this, this embedding here of GSP6 into G is sufficiently nice that you can um, restrict and show that the coefficients of the form the Fourier coefficients of the restriction of this form to, uh, so I'll just say, uh, same is true for the restriction of this form to um, to uh, GSP six, and so we're able to. That's why we're able. To, then we're able to use Q expansion principle, an algebraic Q expansion principle. Uh, we're able to get inside of here. Uh, we're, that's why we're also able to get a, a I guess I shouldn't say piadic family of Eisenstein series, but piadic family of modular forms. Um, and we're able to like be back in business, working in a a, a nice space, uh, namely attached to GSP six. The um, the let me just, so this pairing here following an, uh, kind of a, a familiar approach based on um, what's been done in other cases, such as Shimura's, is we have some differential operator analogous to the one that showed up in his case. The Eisenstein series is yes, um, holomorphic, where um I, yeah where r equals s um this thing here again following a kind of a familiar approach there's something called um so holomorphic uh, projection this holomorphic projection gets applied not to this whole thing where it would just be um zero but to the restriction of this thing so holomorphic projection um on just on the restriction to GSP six. So this whole thing first gets restricted to GSP six, then you apply this, then pair against um, B. And one of the, the key things here that allows us to get a result, because so far it seems kind of like, huh, we've got like some, elements of what we want, but we're not really there. We're like we have an L function related to this integral. Um, the integral is some pairing with some nice properties, the Eisenstein series, but somehow we have to get like back to that, that theorem. We're not, we have to get to the theorem, not back to it. Theorem being the, the punchline of it all. So um, due to results of uh, applying results of um, Garrett and uh, later extended by um, Abhishek Saha, so Paul Garrett and later Abhishek Saha, uh, we get that in fact this uh, this number here because of where the coefficients of this lie, we're able to conclude that this thing uh, lies inside of here. Now there's a long <coughs> this, uh, this thing here involves a very involved analysis of the Fourier coefficients of the Eisenstein series um, 
But what I made long is like the paper is about 60 pages. And I looked last night, the, the discussion of the Fourier expansion, as well as like what happens with this differential operator is uh, 25 pages of the paper. So it's basically, a, I could, the paper could have been called it's like algebra city of uh, Fourier coefficients of Eisenstein series and an application or something. So, um, and actually, in fact, if you take out like all the references in the intro, it's probably like half the paper is, um, computing is a, is a computation of Fourier coefficients um, where the like the inspiration all comes from something on um, on exceptional groups the uh, the bounds here this four and r minus two so this is the right hand side of the critical strip except that we've left off um, three and two or sorry the yeah, right hand side of the critical strip, except we left off um, two and three. Um, where do those where do those numbers uh, come from? They come from looking inside of here. We have to have uh, this compatibility to start off with between um, before we apply the operator. This these we need to have um, like that the weight here is twice whatever s was here, and this is only uh, and we need r is at least as big as s for this differential operator here to make sense. Um, these values here, the, and this this particular Eisenstein series we're working with here converges absolutely for um, <coughs> s at least uh, for, for the weight here has the weight has to be at least six. So that uh, puts the, that puts one constraint on, but then at the, on the other hand, we also have this constraint coming from the r having to be uh, bigger than s, and then you might feel like, wait, how the how on earth do we end up with like a minus two at the end, which is actually the end of the critical star. It is it is the extreme point there, uh, but that came from um, that basically comes out in we we had a shift by two here, and when you work everything out, that guy comes out. I'm not going to write those details there. It's just to give you an like give you an idea of what's going on. You can ask me later if you want me to write it out for you. Um, if you want me to write it out for you, uh, line by line. So. In the end, we get we get this al algebraicity result, which is I, I'd say the, the the biggest the biggest part of the, of course. Okay, the other half is not Eisenstein series, so there's some other work, but right, you have set up stuff leading up to it. So I'd say the, the biggest part of the work is involved in this piece here. Unfortunately, in the the way we wrote these, since we are we are eventually aiming for piadic results, we wrote them in such a way that we can also uh, piadically interpolate. Um, and if you want to do piadic interpolation, it follows. I'm Maybe in the interest of time, we won't write that down now, but it's a similar argument involving piadic modular forms. If you want to know how that goes, you can ask me afterwards. The strategy is similar to what's been employed in other cases, uh, modulo the computation of the Euler factor at P. And that's always a, a tricky point. Um, Zinio was asking me yesterday something about inspiration for like computing some Euler integral for Euler factor at P. And it's like, uh, it's always kind of reduced to something that's been done before. So in my paper with, on unitary groups with Michael Harris and Jan Shuley and Chris Skinner, um, it's about maybe 18 pages or so computing the Euler factor at P. And the idea of this integral is to uh, reduce it to something done by Godeman and Jacquet for GLN. And basically, even if you're not doing piadic things, just for the doubling method, the, the strategy, regardless of how long it took or when it got done, the strategy is always basically reduced to a computation of Godemont Jacquet for GLF. That's the, I mean, that might take a lot of work, but uh, years might pass. So that, that's, just, that's always a strategy. This is not going to, like, this is, that's not what kind of integral we have here. It's not going to um, reduce to that. If some other ideas, but you, like, have to reduce to something known that known thing, or, or otherwise know how to go all the way to the, uh, how uh, all the way to the uh, end and complicating things here. This integral of Aaron is a actually a, a non unique model. I don't know of any, maybe I'm, maybe someone here can correct me, but I don't know of any other examples where people have proved um, algebraicity or piadic interpolation from a um, non unique uh, model before. I think yours had a uniqueness property, right? Novogorsky, yeah. Um, and so I, I, should, I should stop there, but I'm happy to answer uh, questions about any of it uh, either in the question period or later today.